Today's message is wilderness to promise. Everybody say wilderness to promise. Wilderness to promise. There are many Christians who have been brought out of Egypt. They've been baptized. They've gone through the Red Sea. They are presently in the wilderness and they may not receive the promise. The story of Exodus is so important because it is a representation. It is a shadow of the salvation through Jesus Christ. Moses is a type of Christ who leads them. But listen, God gives all of Israel the promise of a land flowing with milk and honey, doesn't he? And yet, how many receive the promise? See, the story of Israel in the wilderness teaches us a very important lesson. God's word is true whether you receive it or not. And you are at risk of not receiving promises if you imitate the Israelites who walked with God and didn't believe what he said. We know, if you know the story, you know that Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land from that generation, but the rest of them did not. And we need to know this story intimately so that we are not among the Israelites who profess to know Moses, who profess to have exited Egypt, who profess to have gone through the Red Sea and be baptized and yet die and perish in the wilderness, not having received the promise and blaming God the whole way and thinking that it's not true. That the promised land is there because there's giants, because there's resistance, because there are difficulties. Suddenly the promise isn't true to the Israelites. God wants us to learn from these people not to die in the wilderness. So much so that Hebrews spend some time on specifically that story, teaching us to not be like those people, but to imitate Joshua and Caleb, to imitate Abraham, to imitate David. And so people who are of faith, they overcome giants knowing that the promise is theirs. This is so important. Joshua overcame giants. David overcame giants. People of faith overcome giants and they believe the promise in the presence of giants. Hallelujah. We're preaching right at the beginning. They believe the promise in the presence of the giants. They slay the giant and take the promise. Hallelujah. If you're joining us online, thank you for being here. Glad that you're here. It's going to be a good one. Make sure you like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel, comment below anything that you learned or any questions that you have. We really do appreciate you. And those of you who have been giving, thank you so much for your generosity. If you'd like to join our community of givers, you can text the word give to 386-753-7337. And thank you for signing up for monthly gifts because that helps us to know what our monthly budget is. It truly is a blessing and a help. In fact, some of what you've sown into the ministry, I've used to now upgrade my live stream studio and we'll be able to begin live streaming regularly. You can check out the He Is Greater podcast on my channel and we'll also be starting something called The Daily Bread very soon, which will be 30 minute Bible studies that you can easily listen to on your drive to work. It's going to be good. Thank you for being here. Love you guys. Be in prayer for us. Be in prayer for me and for my family and for our church that we may be able to overcome the giants that resist us as we persist to the promised land. And we pray for you as well. Let's get into the word together. Are you guys ready? Okay, so I want you to see God's will in Exodus chapter three, verse eight. Now, uh, I'm utilizing the literal word app. This is the NASB 1995. You know we love the literal word here and I recommend it to everybody every time I preach pretty much because the words in the original language are available and you can actually pull them up. So Egyptians, you can see land of the cops, Misraim. So you can see what the Hebrew is and what the definition is. This is true for both the Old Testament and New Testament. Really wonderful. We pray that the Lord blesses the literal word team for giving us such a great tool. I really do. I, I, from the moment I found this tool, I've appreciated it. So we're very grateful. You can download it for free. This is what's beautiful too. They actually obeyed Jesus. When Jesus said, freely you've received, freely give, that's what they've done. They do this for free. They get the word of God out there for free. Oh Lord, that more Christians would behave this way and present everything for free. There's another ministry I've been really pleased with uh, recently is Keith Moore's ministry. He has a church in Sarasota. He has another church, I think, in uh, Missouri. And he um, provides all of his lessons and books and their services and events. They're all free always. He always 
does it for free. And regardless of people's doctrine, if you don't agree on every single doctrine, you can still really appreciate things that people do right. And secondly, he's a man of faith and he teaches faith. And so I like him for that reason. So literal word is free. Keith Moore's faith school is free. We like free. Amen. <laughs> freely you've received, freely give. Okay. So Exodus chapter three, verse eight. Let's read this together. Do you guys like my podium today? Isn't this fun? This is a, it's, a, it's a kitchen island. All right. <laughs> Exodus chapter three, verse eight. So I have come down to deliver. This is the Lord speaking, by the way. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Jebusite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. I read that one early. The Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Listen, God is telling Israel, I have shown up in your life to bring you into this land flowing with milk and honey. And then right from the beginning, it's not like he's hiding the, the fact. He goes, the land that other people occupy. <laughs> so I've come to give you this land. Oh, by the way, it has occupants and those occupants are hostile. Oh, they hate you. They're going to swing their swords at you. Do you understand? They're going to have cities with high walls that you're going to encounter. But I've come to give the land to you. And this is the human experience. God shows up, gives us the promise out of his grace. It's just his free gift of grace. He's excited to give it to us. And he tells us, look, there's an enemy that's going to resist you from receiving what I've promised you. Now, the promise is true. Like we said at the beginning, you're going to have to think about this throughout. The promise is true whether you receive it or not. The promise was true for every Israelite who died in the wilderness. God said he had given them the land and they died in the wilderness. So you must learn from that warning. And you must also learn from Joshua and Caleb how to enter the promised land. You, you, you ever notice how it's Noah and a total of eight people on the ark? Do you understand? It's Joshua and Caleb from that generation who enter. Okay. Okay, listen. The scriptures talk about the many and the few very frequently that few people end up being saved. What does Jesus say? Broad is the path that leads to destruction and many are on it. Narrow is the path that leads to life and only a few find it. That's because you have to listen to precisely the words of Jesus if you're going to walk on that narrow path. He's the only shepherd who knows the exact way. Seriously, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So many people tune in to Joe Rogan to listen to him every single week when he preaches whatever it is he's preaching that week. And they have a hard time tuning in to hear a message on faith. They have a hard time giving their time for an hour or two to hearing God's word and their faith increasing. That just tells you that Jesus is right. That the shepherd Joe Rogan is leading many to destruction. And people are so eager to hear what he and his guests have to say. And they don't have the words of life. The most popular podcast should be one that has the words of life. And yet you're in the enemy's camp in this world. And the most popular podcast is a man whose logo has the third seeing eye on his forehead. Hello. Pagan symbolism right in front of your face and you go, oh no, I'm sure that this has beneficial words that I need to hear. Or you waste your time watching cartoons or playing video games. You're wasting your time when Jesus has the words of life. You've been offered the promised land and for some reason you think because it's promised you're going to enter just because it's promised. You will not enter if you imitate the Israelites who perished. You will enter if you imitate Joshua and Caleb. And the separation between those two groups is faith. Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, I talked about it on the He is Greater podcast last night, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? What a poignant question. Will Jesus find faith when he returns? And faith is very specific. Hebrews 11, 1, this is faith. Listen, faith is confident expectation being convicted that it's done while unseen. That's the literal Greek. That's why I don't read a translation anymore, not very frequently, when I, because the literal Greek is so much better 
than what we're translating it as. We always translate pragma as things, and it should be has been done. And so it's conviction that it has been done while unseen. That's faith. And you need to hear these words. Jesus said between Martha and Mary, Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha was doing necessary work, but it wasn't a higher priority than hearing Jesus's words. Okay, it's necessary to cook food for people, but there's a time and a place. And sometimes Jesus's word needs to cut in on your plans. Mary sits at the feet of Jesus and Martha says, don't you care, Jesus? Mary needs to come and help me. And he says, Mary has found what is good and it will not be taken from her. It's always right to sit at the feet of Jesus. I got bills to pay. Your bills will be paid by the Lord if you listen to his word and trust him. Hello. So many people prioritize work above the word. No wonder they're suffering at work. Work is not God. Work is not your provider. If you get fired because you're pursuing Jesus, Jesus has a better job for you. I got the best job in the world. My schedule wouldn't work for any boss other than Jesus. And yet he provides everything, everything that I need. If I had, if I had an earthly boss still, I'd be like, hey, I've got a live stream and preach the gospel tonight. I, I'm not going to be able to come in. They'd be like, you're fired. So the Lord just provides for me. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. That's why, that's why I full-time minister, because I know i got to do what the Holy Spirit says. Well, listen, I'm not special. <laughs> the same God that provides for me will provide for you if you'll trust Him. But if you prioritize work and these other things above God's Word, you're going to perish in the wilderness. Okay? You've been promised all these precious promises, but you'll perish in the wilderness if you're not hearing God's Word. Jesus asked his disciples after a bunch of them left him in John 6. He said, you don't want to go too, do you? And they said, where will we go? Peter answered him, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. Amen. Why are you going to Joe Rogan? And I'm, I'm not picking on him. I'm saying he's one of many uh, shepherds, false shepherds that are alive today that have millions of people eager to hear their words. What, what, is, what is he going to lead you to? Has he once told you that it is true that Jesus Christ is the word of God in the flesh that came and died on the cross for your sins and resurrected from the grave three days later. John says that anyone who doesn't teach that is the spirit of the Antichrist. Anyone that doesn't teach you the word of God and that its promises are true is of the Antichrist, whether they're wearing clear, you know, clergy clothes or whether they're on a podcast. It, don't, it doesn't really matter who the voice is. If they're not teaching you Jesus and the inheritance of Jesus, they're teaching the Antichrist doctrines. So the promise is given to all of Israel, and it's given to you. And the first step to receiving it is hearing it. That is the first step. Faith comes by, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing continually the word of Christ. And so, can we all agree that it's God's will for them to make it to the promised land? Yes. Yeah, it is. He says it. Look, what does verse 8 say? So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. So what is God's will and intent for the Israelites? That they do exactly what he just said. I mean, he's not making it up. Okay, you've got a misunderstanding of sovereignty if you don't understand that God really means this and this is his will, despite people not entering the promised land. This is his will. If you don't receive the will of God, it's because he has bestowed to you free choice. Where does it say that? Genesis. God said to Adam, you are free to eat any tree in the garden. Before he even told him why he shouldn't eat the tree of knowledge, he bestowed to him autonomy. Free will, free choice. And he said, you're free to eat anything. Deuteronomy 30, 19. Behold, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. So God has given us this choice. So our will can oppose his will. What do I mean by that? His ultimate will, his highest will, is that everyone who believes receives. That if you believe, you receive. The just shall live by faith. Abraham was credited righteousness by faith. So that's his will. And of course, he also wills that you come to faith, but he will not violate that free will choice that he's given to you. He won't violate his own law. So if the law of this realm is that you have the choice, he won't violate that law. Does that make sense? You are free to eat of any tree in the garden. Hence why Adam could eat the tree of knowledge, because God won't violate his own law. 
that he bestowed to man. You are free to eat any tree in the garden. And so Adam made his choice. So God does not violate choice. He does this because he loves us. Love always gives choice. It makes the relationship meaningful. It may, I just talked about this on a podcast recently, but it makes the relationship meaningful that you have a choice, that, that my wife Brandy has a choice to love me or not love me. That's what makes our marriage meaningful. And if we're married to Christ, it means that we consented to the marriage, folks. He didn't lock us in. He doesn't force us to receive. It's really important. This is not Stockholm Syndrome Jesus. This is the God who loves us and gives us free will. Amen? Amen? He's sovereign. His will will get fulfilled, meaning all of his prophecies, they'll be fulfilled because he foreknows what we're going to decide and he sets us in time and space accordingly. But ultimately, he's given you the choice that is his will to either receive this wonderful promise that he's given or not receive it. And that's why we see Joshua and Caleb receive it and a bunch of them do not. A bunch of them do not. Do you want to receive the promise? If you do, say amen. Yes, amen. Me too. Okay. All right. So God's will. Now go to Leviticus 20, 24. We'll also see God's will there. Leviticus 20, 24. Hallelujah. Leviticus 20, 24. It says this, Hence I have said to you, you are to possess their land, and I myself will give it to you to possess it, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, who has separated you, from the peoples. What does he say here? Isn't that the same promise? Hence I have said to you, you are to possess their land and I myself will give it to you to possess it. A land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. So Israel is repeatedly told this throughout the scriptures. You are supposed to have this land. When they die in the wilderness... They were supposed to have the land. Do you understand? Yeah. If you don't receive the inheritance that Jesus has secured for you, you were supposed to. God promised it to you. But it's received by faith and he will not force you to have faith or to remain in faith. Did, did Jesus force Peter to keep walking on water even though it was his will and he told him to come out and walk on the water? No, Jesus didn't force him to keep walking on water. As soon as Peter had unbelief, seeing with his eyes and was filled with fear, once he was filled with unbelief, Jesus let him sink because he's not going to violate his choice. He reached in to help him, but he did not violate his choice. He did not violate his choice. Look at this. Look at these statements. Let's go to, uh, Isaiah 30, 15. Look at this. For thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, in repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. Okay, so God has said, in repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. Is that the promise of God to human beings? Yes. Oh yeah, through Jesus Christ, when you repent and you rest in him, you'll be saved. When you're quiet before him and you have faith in him, trust in him, you'll have strength. What's the next line though? But you were not willing. And you said, no, for we will flee on horses. Therefore you shall flee. God will not violate your choice to not believe him. His promise is sincere. Everyone can actually receive salvation. Everybody through Jesus Christ. People who don't, you are not willing. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem in the Gospels. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stone the prophets. Let's read it. I want you to read it. Look at this. Luke 13, 34 is one of the renditions of it. It says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stone those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Are you hearing me? Yes. Are you hearing Jesus? More importantly, these are his words. 
I wanted to gather your children together, you would not have it. Who's, who is Jesus putting responsibility on, God or man? Man, don't listen to any teacher and throw out all doctrine that puts all this responsibility on God. It's never on God. God said immediately in Genesis 3, cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. So there is no responsibility on God. You don't get to blame God's sovereignty for your sickness. You don't get to blame God's sovereignty for being in hell. You don't get to blame God. God doesn't actually give you that permission because it's not his fault. He gave you the promise you were not willing. The people who perish in the wilderness, it's their, they are to blame. And Joshua and Caleb are, the, are entered not because God just, oh, my election is that I'm just picking Joshua and Caleb because I like them and I don't like you guys. Joshua and Caleb believed. God foreknows who believes and therefore elects them. Amen. Chooses them. But all of Israel was given the same promise. All of humanity is given the promise for salvation. And Jesus and the Father like we saw in Isaiah, and now we're seeing here, put responsibility on man. Look at this. Are you receiving something? Yes. Stephen's about to be stoned to death. He says this, you men who are stiff-necked, this is Acts 7.51, by the way, sorry. <laughs> you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. I mean, those three instances indicate that God wants to do something and we are resisting him. And you go, how's that possible? Because he put it in his law and he doesn't violate his law. Adam, you are free to eat any tree in the garden. Once the sovereign God has bestowed that kind of choice to a creature, they have the choice. Why do you think Satan could rebel against him before any of us even existed? Because Satan was bestowed the same autonomy. He was given the same autonomy. The scriptures make very clear that wickedness was found in him. In him, of his own volition, he decided to rebel. I will become like God. I will be like the Most High. That's what he says. That's what Isaiah said that Satan said in his heart. This is really important. Let's not let her hit the camera. This is really important. Numbers, go to Numbers 33. Let's look at the promise. Now we're going to start looking at, um, I know we've looked at it, but we're going to look at how God speaks when he gives a promise. And you need to recognize this if you're ever going to receive his promises. You've got to see how he speaks, okay? Now there's weird stuff going on with the battery. I charged this to 100% last night. For whatever reason, it's at 50 when I start my sermon. So if it goes out, I still have the scriptures, don't worry. Numbers 33, 50. Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan opposite Jericho, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figured stones and destroy all their molten images and demolish all their high places. And you shall take possession of the land and live in it for... Pay attention to the way he says this. I have given the land to you to possess it. Now, what tense is he in? Pretense, present tense, or past tense? Who knew that we were going to be learning English today? Is he speaking in pretense, present tense, or past tense? God is speaking in past tense that it's done Hallelujah. while unseen. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11.1. 1. God is speaking in faith. He has given it to them while they're outside of it. Hello. This is why so many people perish. They perish because they don't adopt the faith of Abraham. God spoke the same way to Abraham. Did you know that? He spoke the same way to Abraham. Look, Genesis 15, 18. We're going to take a look at some of the ways that he spoke to Abraham. Genesis 15, 18. This is one of them. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I 
have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. Pretense, present tense, or past tense. And this is way before even what we just read. And God says, I have given this land to your descendants. I've already, I've done it. Hello. But to the perspective of the Israelites in the wilderness, they think he didn't. And there are a lot of people alive today that have been given the promises of God and they're not receiving them. So they think that they're not true. The devil has lied to them and stolen the promise from their heart and they're in a state of unbelief. And this goes for Christians as well. Because the story is Israel. The story is Israel and we are Israel. And there are people of faith in Israel and there are people of unbelief in Israel. Do you know that? Both. Both. They all came out of Egypt, didn't they? Hello? Christians have all done these things. They've all believed that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead, and they've been baptized. Okay, that's Egypt, and that's the Red Sea. Now, if you're past that, you're presently in the wilderness on your way to the promise. So what's going on? Well, you are either among the group that's going to enter and receive the promise, or you're among the group that perishes, and the group that perishes is bigger than the group that receives. Glad you came to church today. I am. See, these are the words of life. You won't know this unless God's word told you. And God's word told you, I have given this land. And you're supposed to learn from that language. Oh, he has given it to me. This is why Isaiah 53 speaks about Jesus even before he came. By his wounds, we are healed, present tense. And then by the time of Peter, 1 Peter 2.24, it's past tense. He says, by his wounds, we were healed. That's the same as saying, I have healed you. Just like saying, I have given this land to you. I have healed you. Well, if you focus on the fever, if you focus on the pain, if you focus on the chronic issue, if you focus on the giant, you'll perish with the illness despite the promise being given to you. This is the tough news, but it's true. And we can learn from it so we don't perish. Do you understand? The good news is the promise is true at all times. The promise hasn't changed. God's not shifting shadows. He's not changing. I, the Lord, change not. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the promise is the same. The nature of God is the same. The power of God is the same. The only thing that oscillates and changes is Peter. He walks on water and he sinks. Jesus' word to walk on water never changed, despite Peter walking on it and sinking. Jesus' word to Peter to heal the sick never changed despite Peter failing to heal in Matthew 17, but raising the dead later in the book of Acts. God's word and nature never changes. Man changes. I oscillate between faith and unbelief. I'm the problem, not God. And you're wasting your time if you want to sit around and scream at the sky. You'll never receive anything. Job received nothing from God so long as he rebuked God. The problem was never God. It was always Job. And once Job realized that and repented, then he received the promise. Then he was restored. Do you understand? Job lists all the reasons why he shouldn't shouldn't be experiencing what he's experiencing. And so many people are doing exactly the same thing. Oh, I'm Job. Well, you better learn the Job lesson then. All these people are like, I'm Job. God's teaching me a lesson. Yeah, the the lesson's in the book. Did you finish the book? The lesson is that Job repented in dust and ash and believed that God can do all things and that he's the teacher and we're the student. That's his final statements to God. And that that he was wrong. His doctrines were wrong. Do you know that Job makes that statement at the end? That his beliefs and his, he said he darkened wise counsel. He, He had spoke wrongly. Things too wonderful for him. He was wrong. His doctrine was wrong. His behavior was wrong. And when he came back to faith that God can do all things and he repented of his sin of pride, he was restored. This is what God does. He was restored. God restores those who place their faith in him. But there are many today, just like the Israelites, who are not receiving the promise, though it's true. And the only way you're going to receive it is by hearing it and by believing what you're hearing. You must mix 
God's word with your faith. And then you'll receive. So I have given this land. Everybody say, I have given. This is how God gives his promises. They're already done. I have given them to you. Hello? I have given them to you. Look at Genesis 17, 5. More about Abraham. Genesis 17, 5. No longer shall your name be called... I'm going to turn that off. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Uh oh, there's that statement again. This is three times I'm showing you. What, what does he say? I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Amen. Well, if you don't know the story, you don't know when God says this to Abraham. Abraham is 75 years old and childless. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> when he's told he's going to be a father of many nations, he's 75 years old and childless. And this promise doesn't manifest in his life for 25 years. Isaac is born when he's 100 years old. I have made you the multitude of many nations. Abraham's duty and the reason he's the father of the faith and the reason why he's referenced so frequently is because he's different. Folks, if Abraham was just like you and me, he, he wouldn't be in the book. He's, he's different. He's different. Abraham's built different. Okay. His faith is different. He's an example for us. What's his example? He believes God when God says, I have made you the father of many nations. I have given this land to you and to your descendants. I have done it. It is done before you see it. God operates this way. Let there be light. You know, when he spoke that there was darkness. The word comes first, then the light. The word first, then the manifestation. Believing the word and then reality. Jesus said when he was going to raise Lazarus, he said, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Not you will see and then you will believe. No, if you try and see it first, you'll never receive it. If you use your eyes, you'll see giants and you will never receive it. Hello, the Israelites saw giants in the land and perished. Joshua saw giants and said, they're, they're, they're prey. We're going we're gonna to take their cities. David saw a giant and said, I'm going to cut your head off. Hello. This is how they talked. I've already done it. I've already done it. That's how they talk. They took God's words and put them in their mouth and spoke them out. They believed in their heart and they spoke them out. I have Jericho. I have taken Goliath. I have done this. I have done that before seeing it. By his wounds, I am healed. Yes. Thank you, Father. Yes. I have healed you through Jesus. That's God's word to you. I have saved you through Jesus. I have forgiven you. So many Christians are walking around in shame, unnecessary shame. First John 1 John 1.9, confess your sins. Confess your sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. That word cleanse means heal and heal us from all unrighteousness. Forgive and heal. Forgive and heal. That's why Psalm 103 says that, I have, that he pardons all of our guilt and he heals all of our diseases. Amen. How are you going to receive these? Persisting in faith. Through faith and patience inherit the promises. I have given you the land. I have made you the father of many nations. Amen. I have done these things for you. Your duty is to believe it if you're going to receive what's promised. God will not force you to receive his promises. He's laid them on the table and they're received by faith. I have given this to you. Come and take it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The children's bread. It's on the table, folks. The children's bread is on the table. The children's bread in the Gospels is healing. I never reject my children eating food. Do you understand? I might regulate what they're eating. You know, we're not going to eat ice cream all day. But I always make sure they're fed. The children's bread is healing. It's on the table. Take it and eat. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But if you don't believe that it's on the table and it's given, you're not going to receive it. You're going to focus on the fever instead of the bread. You're going to focus on the paralyzed limb instead of the bread. You're going to focus on the dead body instead of the bread. Do you understand? 
You know, Peter had to look past Tabitha's body. He couldn't focus on that. He prayed. He prayed. Close your eyes. Pray. Look at the word, not the dead body. Look at the word. Tabitha arise and she gets up. There's only one way that your faith is going to ever increase to Peter's faith, and it's by hearing the word continually and believing that it's already done, that Christ is the resurrection and the life. It's already done. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. If you receive it, something say amen. amen. All right, but what happened to these people? What happened to them? Go to Numbers 14, 28 through 30. Numbers 14, 28 through 30. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses will fall in this wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. What happened? What happened? Isn't that a bummer? Yeah. It is a bummer. It should be a bummer. You should be bummed out. It's a bummer. They're, they're promised a land flowing with milk and honey. It, when they go into the land to spy it out, they see the food and they're like, wow, it's amazing. <laughs> they see the cities. They're like, wow, it's amazing. Yeah, right? What else was there? Resistance. Giants are going to stand between you and the promises of God. They will. You don't get to rest from that until heaven. You, you, you don't rest from the giants until heaven. You just don't. You are fighting giants right now. The New Testament is so clear that Satan will resist you. And Peter says, resist him firm in the faith. Fight the giants. If you cower from the giants, if you whine about the giants, if you believe the giants, you perish in the wilderness. You won't receive what God has promised, though it's promised to you because he, man, he loved these people, folks. Look at everything that he's done. You know, he's done miracle after miracle after miracle for them that they don't appreciate. By the way, I need to testify and thank the Lord. You always want to thank, you know, Jesus healed 10 uh, lepers and only one came back. It's wrong, Okay. Take inventory of the good that God has done in your life. Okay, so I've been sharing with you about Tiernan. Praise God. Okay, so he's been eating all dairy products without any issue. I mean, when we go to an ice cream place, he eats ice cream. When we go to pizza, he eats pizza. But get this. He's also been eating sweet potatoes, which would cause a reaction before. We had sweet potatoes last night. No reaction. No inflammation. No asthma. Praise God. Right? Slay the giants. Uh, he's been eating carrots. Carrots used to make him get inflamed. Praise God, not getting inflamed, Amen. not having asthma. That's Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I named him Tiernan Caleb. That's his middle name. Not knowing that I had some giants to slay. And uh, <laughs> he ate um, cookies that had egg in them. Normally that would be a reaction as well. So I, glory God, I give glory to God. By the word of the Lamb by the, word of their, the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Yes. We glorify God because His promises are true. In fact, His promises that everything He created is good and nothing is to harm my son or me or any of us, uh, that's all true while He's having asthma attacks, while He's reacting. This is why people die in the wilderness because they see the asthma and they see the inflammation. And, and, and people will think you're crazy too. I mean, People have thought I'm crazy when I talk about God healing Tiernan. Well, now he's eating ice cream in front of their face. Now they see the glory of God. But it was true when I was giving him asthma treatments. Do you understand? It was true when I gave him Benadryl. The promise was still true. This is the only way to beat the giants. They don't stop. The only way you lose is if you quit. They don't stop unless you fight them. Fight the good fight of faith. And they don't willingly leave either. You must fight them. How do you fight them? 
The Bible tells you. Ephesians 6 tells you how to fight the devil. Put on the whole armor of God. Shield of faith, all of it's important, but shield of faith to block the lies of the enemy. Sword of the Spirit to strike back with the Word of God. Oh, your son is going to stay an asthmatic for the rest of his life. It's only going to get worse. No, everything God created is good. God gave us lungs to breathe. Strike back. So I get to praise God. I get to rejoice in God. And if a symptom shows up, it doesn't mean my son's not healed. This is where people get destroyed too. Oh no, a hive on his lip. Oh no, a giant. Slay it. God's word is true. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. So the only ones who enter are, are Joshua and Caleb. Let's learn about Joshua and Caleb. Would you like to learn about Joshua and Caleb? Let's learn about them. So um, I'm going to go to Numbers 13. Uh, I'm going to switch off of the app for a moment. I'm going to go to Numbers 13. Let's try and make that last a little longer for us. Um, and let's read Numbers 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send out men for yourself to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, everyone a leader among them. So there's 12 tribes. That means 12 men are going to go. Verse 3. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the sons of Israel. These then were their names. Okay, so something to point out real quick. These are all heads of tribes. This is like a group of 12 ministers, 12 well-respected pastors. And unfortunately, only two of them are going to believe God. And they're heads of Israel. They are heads of tribes. So heads and authorities in the church does not automatically mean word of faith. A lot of heads and authorities in the church are going to do exactly what these 10 did. They're going to see giants and they're going to go, we're beat. We're as good as beat. See you in heaven. We're whooped. We're whooped here, but I'll see you in heaven. That's essentially their attitude. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran. Okay, verse four. These then were the names from the tribe of Reuben, Shemua or Shemua, the son of Zachur, from the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori, from the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, remember Caleb, from the tribe of Issachar, Igal, the son of Joseph, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hosea, the son of Nun. So that's going to be Joshua, but Hosea, son of Nun, remember him. Verse 9, from the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu, from the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Zodi, Sodai, from the tribe of Joseph, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susai, from the tribe of Dan, or yeah, Amiel, the son of Gamali, from the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael, from the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vopsi. That's an interesting name. And from the tribe of Gad, Guel, the son of Machai. These are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, but Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Joshua. So he changed his name from Hosea to Yehoshua. The Lord saves. That's what he changed his name to. The Lord saves. The Lord delivers. Joshua did a lot of delivering through his book, didn't he? <laughs> now, sometimes I think that the Lord lists all these names so that the heavens can get a good laugh when we try and say them. Verse 17. When Moses sent, no, it's to keep record. Verse 17. When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, go up there into the Negev. Then go up into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live in it are few or many. Oh, are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. And how is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are the people in open camps or in fortifications? And how is the land? Is it productive or unproductive? Are there trees in it or not? And show yourselves courageous and get some of the fruit from the land. So be courageous. Be courageous. Fear is not faith. If you're in fear, you're not in faith. Faith is courageous and joyful. Remember these things. Okay. Um, now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. Verse 21. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness in Zin, as far as Rahab, at Lebo Hamath, 
When they had gone up into the Negev, they came to Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. So this is also a record book. That's why you're getting all these details. It's important. It actually, it's amazing because when we discover archaeological findings, it just over and over and over proves the Bible. It's never do the archaeological findings like undo the Bible. They always affirm what happened. So that's why these details are here because it helps archaeologists to prove all these events. Verse 23, Then they came to the valley of Eskol, and from there they cut off a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two men with some of the pomegranates and the figs. That place was called the Valley of Eskol because of the cluster which the sons of Israel cut off from there. So they cut off this giant, uh, these, these grapes, these pomegranates, these figs. They were giant. Verse 25. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days. So they're there 40 days. They got a good report on what the land is. They know what's going on there. Verse 26. They went on and came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Okay, so they showed them the fruit of the land. In other words, it is as good as God said. Amen. The land itself is truly good. Okay, all right, verse 27. So they reported to him and said, We came into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Oh, that they would have just appreciated the fact that God said, I've given that to you. Sometimes Christians will get a taste of the promise. They'll get a taste. But the full reception is by faith. Hello. Maybe you're getting a taste during this sermon. You can feel that this is right and good. Well, you're going to have to face a giant right after this sermon. That's how this goes. Let's continue on. This is its fruit. Verse 28. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. Uh-oh. They're fortified and very large because they're yours, friends. They built them for you. But they don't see that. And indeed, we saw the descendants of Anak there. You know who that is? That's the Nephilim. That's the giants. The descendants of Anak. These are giant humans. Verse 29. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites are living in the hill country. And the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. So what they do? They said, hey, yeah, it's really nice land. Cities are big and fortified. And to top it all off, there's Nephilim there. There's giants. There's the race of human beings that exists even post-flood, which it seems angels must have procreated with women more than once. But even post-flood, there are demonic hybrid giants. Yikes. Sons of Anak. Okay, look at this, verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will certainly prevail over it. Do you hear the difference in language? Yes. Pay attention. If your heart's in faith, you will speak faith. If your heart's in unbelief, you will speak fear. You'll speak courageously and in faith in God's promises. If you're truly in faith, you'll say, well, maybe it's not his will. Well, I'm, I'm waiting on the Lord. Well, my pastor says. Well, the doctor said. Well, the giant said. The giant reminded me that there's a fortified city. The giant reminded me that he's a giant. And he's strong. You're going to die in the wilderness. And I say that in love. Pastors won't preach it because they're like, that's not loving. Too many multitudes die in the wilderness for me to be quiet about it. And we're not loving you if we let you die in the wilderness. I'm watching Christians everywhere perish and they're not supposed to. Not supposed to. I've given the land to you. 
So we want to start talking like Caleb. We should by all means go up and take possession of it. Amen. Like, what are we waiting for? God said it's ours. I really like those cities. They really had nice stone walls. I really like those grapes and pomegranates. They were huge. I mean, to sustain giants, they had to be. Do you understand? It had to be a plentiful land. It had to be abundance for giants to live there. God's like, it's yours. I'm not having these hybrid demons have it. You, you, you can have it. And Caleb's like, I'll, I'll be happy. Let's go and take it. For we will certainly prevail over it. We will certainly, everybody say certainly. certainly. We will certainly prevail over it. I will certainly take those cities. Who's he boasting in? His own strength? No. This is something you got to realize. Okay, yeah, cancer is stronger than you. It's not stronger than Jesus. Nope. That's right. the whole point. Caleb is weaker physically than the giants. Do you understand? 15 foot giant and what? Six foot Caleb maybe at best? Might even be shorter. Might be like me, little guy. Hello? David was little. That giant, according to earthly measures, is going to grind his bones to make his bread. Right? That's the idea of giants. How's he talking like that then? How is someone who's weaker than the giants talking like that and saying, I'm certainly going to take those cities? Who's he trusting? God's might. He's trusting God's might and power. Romans 4 says that Abraham was fully assured that what God had promised, he had power to fulfill. Amen. He knows whatever power he needs to take those cities will come at the right time. Yes. Hallelujah. He knows that God's word is the power and the word's been given to him. So it's done. Yes. It's done. While unseen, it's done. He's just eager to come and get it. He's like, I'm, let's just go. Let's go. Quit talking about the giants and let's go take it. That's his attitude. Certainly. Everybody say certainly. Certainly, certainly prevail over it. Yeah. Certainly. Certain. Certainly prevail. Not maybe. Not if the doctor says. Not if the medicine works. Certainly prevail. Amen. Not if the boss gives me a raise. I will certainly prevail. Hello. Yeah. Not if this happens first, I will prevail. No, I will prevail because God's word says I will. Hallelujah. Doesn't faith feel good? Yes. You were created to be a creature who has faith. Yes. Faith, hope, and love. Yes. Faith, hope, and love. Being confident, sure that it's done while unseen, expecting it, and loving your neighbors. This is, this is what we're called to do, folks. Notice Caleb, wants, he wants everybody to have it. He's like, no, let's go. Let's go as a group. Let's go and take it. Love of neighbor is there in his heart too. Verse 31. But the man who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people because they are too strong for us. That's called the bad report. Everybody say bad report. Bad report. You got faith and you got bad reports. And believe me, when you start making statements of faith, you're going to hear, especially from Christians, Satan will speak right through them, probably right when you make your statement of faith, to say stuff like that. You make your statement of faith, and you'll be hoping the Christians will agree with you and they'll be the first ones to call into question your faith. Satan spoke through Peter. He'll speak through your uncle. He'll speak through your doctor sometimes. God will speak through a doctor too, but you need to know the word to know who's talking. We are not able to go up against the people because they are too strong for us. What are their eyes set on? The strength of the giants. What's Caleb and Joshua's eyes set on? The strength of God. Amen. If you fixate on the power of cancer, you're not fixating on the power of God. If you fixate on the power of paralyzation, you're not fixating on the power of God. If you fixate on the power of death, you're not fixating on the power of life of God. Do you understand? Yes. And what you're fixating on is what will persist in you. Yes. If you see the giant and you go, it's too strong for me, it shall be too strong for you. According to your faith, be it done unto you, works both ways, sadly. 
according to your faith be it done unto you. You believe you can't take the land even though I've promised it to you? Then you will not take the land. Your bodies will lie in the wilderness. Isn't that how God spoke to them? You shall surely die in the wilderness. Why? Their faith. It becomes even more evident in Hebrews, but you see it already. Verse 32. So they brought a bad report. Everybody say bad report. report. That's where that term comes from. So they brought a bad report of the land which they had spied out to the sons of Israel, saying the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. That's how people talk about sickness too, don't they? It devours bodies. Devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are people of great stature. We also saw the Nephilim there. The sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Sight. Did you hear that word? Sight. Your eyes will kill you. This is not, this is not a joke. I, Genesis 3, she saw the fruit and it was pleasing to the eye and she took some and ate and gave it to her husband and he ate and the eyes of them both were opened and they saw the giants. Clearly, Caleb's eyes were fixated on the promise of God. And on the goodness of the land. He said it's a land flowing with milk and honey. And boy, before I saw it, I knew it was true. And now I've seen it. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. Even the doubters agreed that it was a land flowing with milk and honey. In fact, all the evidence was there to trust God. And it is for you too. All the evidence is there. You have the word of God and it's true. And you've got the evidence that you need. And yet 10 doubted and two believed. All Israelites... I'm not even including unbelievers in this. I'm not including non-Christians. I'm talking about in-house Israelites grafted in, believing in Jesus Christ. Ten out of twelve are not believing according to this story. Hence why when you find somebody who preaches faith, you're like relieved about it. I'm nothing special. It's just our spirits get relieved to just hear the word of God and like, oh, you, oh it is true. I can believe it. Because everybody keeps telling me I can't. Yes, you can believe it. It is true. Be glad. Belief means be glad. We're like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Now let's continue on into chapter 14. Then all the congregation raised their voices and cried out. And the people wept that night. So notice they're weeping instead of rejoicing. Joshua and Caleb were ready to rejoice, weren't they? They had an attitude of, let's rejoice and let's go take it. They were ready for a party that night, yeah. a godly party. But, you know, get the music going. Let's, let's, let's worship the Lord. Let's rejoice. We're entering the promised land. Let's go and take it. Right. We saw it. It's good. No, the whole congregation wept. Belief means be glad. Leaf. Look it up. L-I-E-F in the Oxford Dictionary. Gladness. That's one of the root words of belief, is be glad. When you really are trusting what you haven't yet seen, and despite evidence against it, you have the evidence of God's word and his power, then you can be glad and you can rejoice. You can be Paul and Silas in chains, persecuted for the gospel, bound by Rome. Giants are resisting you and you're praising God in the chains. If they didn't praise God in the chains, those chains would have never came off. The reason why they are Paul and Silas and the reason why the story is there is because they're men of faith. And when they believed God and praised him in the midst of the giants, the whole jail shook and a miracle took place and they were freed by faith. You go in, in chains, serving the Lord, and now all of a sudden you're bound and you're in chains and you weep. Get used to the chains. Get used to the wilderness. I'm preaching this because I don't want that for you. God doesn't want it for you. I have given the land to you. I have given Jesus to you. I have given the inheritance to you. We talked about this in last week's sermon, that Jesus secured forgiveness of sins and an inheritance. 
an inheritance among who? Abraham and the descendants of Abraham. All the blessings in the Bible are for you. Hence why the devil always is saying stuff like, well, you're not Israel and that was for them. You are Israel. You can perish in the wilderness or you can receive the promises. You are Israel. Paul says very clearly, and he's a Pharisee, and I trust him over whatever you are. And, and, and he says, as a Pharisee and as a Jew, you've been grafted in to Israel. You are sons and daughters of Abraham by faith. You are fellow partakers of the promise. You are inheritors. Okay, so I believe the Jew who told me that I've been grafted in because he was speaking by the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to believe somebody else telling me I'm not Israel. I am Israel. And I have the faith of Abraham. And therefore, I'm an inheritor of the promise. But I can die in the wilderness. I can stay in the chains. I can sink instead of walk on water. According to your faith, be it done unto you, works both ways. Faith in Satan, you get Satan's promises, which is torment. Faith in God, you get God's promises, which is only goodness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're reading this not to discourage you. It's, it's sobering but it's not discouraging because you don't have to be these people. You can be Joshua and Caleb. <laughs> you can choose to believe. Hallelujah. Say, I believe. I, believe. I, rejoice. I rejoice. The promises are true. The promises are true. All right. So Numbers 14, verse 2. And all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the entire congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or even if we had died in this wilderness... So why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's appoint a leader and return to Egypt. This is more significant than you think. Egypt is the old life. Egypt is under Satan again. And many Christians decide after exiting Egypt that, well, maybe this stuff isn't true. And then they start talking about going back to Egypt. And boy, when you hear that kind of language, friends, you need to minister to that person. There's a lie in the church that you can't apostate. There's, that's such a lie. Satan is the first apostate. He's a perfect angel and he apostates and falls. And then he teaches people that they can't apostate. And he's the first apostate. So people can apostate and return to Egypt. Don't go back. Don't go back to the old life. Don't go back. There's nothing for you there. And you will not die in the wilderness. When you trust in God, His promise is true. You will not die in wilderness. There's nothing good for you in Egypt. You will not die in the wilderness. You are going to the promised land. That's the attitude of Joshua and Caleb. I'm not going back to Egypt. <laughs> That's their attitude. I believe that I'm going to receive the promised land. Yes. That's their attitude. And they're in the same wilderness as everybody else. You understand? Same giants, same difficulties. So I, I'm not superior to you. I, I've had to take my children to the emergency room, but I've also seen the miracles of God in my body and in theirs. God has forgiven me of my sins. He's provided my material needs and he's healed my body. He's done all those kinds of things in my life. I've walked on water and I've sunk just like Peter, but that doesn't change the promise of God. When I've been in a sink moment or in a sink season, it's not God's fault. It's me. i got to return to faith. Yeah. But I, I was healed miraculously of COVID. I mean, I had it. I was getting worse. I was descending for five days, and then it left my body in faith. And I was, I was believing Romans 4 specifically, fully assured that what God had promised, he had power to perform. I was done with the fear of COVID. I was like, no. Okay, are you listening? I've been fighting tinnitus a couple years now, and it's quieter than it's ever been. And I don't say that as a lie. I'm telling you the truth. Amen. Most people are like, well, tinnitus only gets louder and it only gets worse. Not for me. Amen. It gets quieter. That's right. That's right. It's, going uh -huh. it's going away. Yeah. <laughs> By his wounds, I am healed. Amen. Amen. That's right. yes. Pastor here at UBIC, he had a deaf ear. God healed it, opened it right up. Yeah. Deaf yeah. ear. Since childhood, God opened it up. I serve the God of miracles. Amen. I serve the God of promises. Amen. I serve the faithful God. We're the, we're the ones who are faithless at times. He's always faithful. He's ready to take us in. 
Give God glory. Think about what he's done for you in your life. How many, even if you're sick right now, how many times have you come back to health from sickness? Stop focusing on the sickness. Stop giving it glory. God has brought you out time and time again. Stop focusing on the debt. Give God glory. God has brought you out time and time again. Now, there could be decisions that you could change. Hey, hear the Lord. There are things that you need to slow down the amount you're eating. Okay? Okay, eating healthy is biblical. Exercising is biblical. Right? There are things that we need to do in faith. Who ultimately heals us, though? God. But there are actions in faith that you should take. And not just sit around and, you know, supposedly confess. Well, if you really believe it, do something about it too. Hello? Fight. Fight. You know, it was noble that the woman with the issue of blood was going to doctors and fighting the illness instead of giving into it. That was noble. It was noble. It was. But the healing came through Jesus Christ, didn't it? But it was noble to fight. Don't stop fighting. Fight. Make changes. Fight. Fight the good fight of faith. And lay hold of the promise that God has offered to you. Fight while bleeding. Yes. And the blood will stop. That's right. Your faith has made you well. Isn't that exactly what he said? Daughter, your faith has made you well. That's how Jesus talked to people about healing. According to your faith, be it done unto you. Regain your sight. Your faith has made you well. He says it so many different times and ways. Nothing is impossible for them that believe. This is how he talked to people. This is what we're supposed to listen to and believe is true. Maybe you're in debt. You might be in debt because you are misspending. Promise of God for provision is there, but there's a problem in your heart. What's in your heart? You're letting debts remain outstanding. You're using debt to buy things you don't need. And it spirals. And now you're using debt just to pay your bills. But it started at utilizing debt and things to buy things you didn't need. And the Bible says the buyer is slave to the lender and do not become slaves of human beings. In other words, don't take on debts. And if you believe that you have to have debt in order to survive, that's your doubt robbing you of God's provision. You do not have to have debt in order for God to provide for you. He will not provide for you with a high interest rate. He will provide for you exactly what you need. No interest because he's good like that. That's what he does. Well, how do you walk in it? You have to believe that. You have to believe that he is the Lord who will provide. Abraham knew him as the Lord, our provider. Do you? Moses knew God as the Lord, our healer. Do you? Do you understand? Let no debt remain outstanding except for the continuing debt of loving one another. So the Bible is real clear. Don't be in debt. Well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor. What do you mean? I had credit cards and all that nonsense just like you did. Now, if I use a credit card, it's just to get the perks and the points, and I just I pay it off by the grace of God. I, don't, I boast in God. I'm not, I'm not boasting in myself. What I'm saying is there's a different way of living when your mind shifts and you believe with the heart what God has said, Amen. that he's your provider. Do I live in luxury? No. Now, that's the key. Most people are living above their means, beyond their means, beyond what they actually need. And God's not in that. You want a Maserati. God didn't promise you a Maserati. You want that six bed, four bath house. That's not necessarily automatically his will for you. God's will for you is to provide for you fully. You know, he doesn't want you paying a mortgage for 30 years. I'm not faulting you. I'm saying to get out of the system that everyone's in, you have to start believing differently. The world goes, well, you got to be in a a mortgage, a a death deal. That's what mortgage means, a death deal for 30 years. And then you need to have uh, insurance for everything. And God says, I'll provide for you. I'll take care of you. Don't be in fear and I'll provide. That's how you, so these kinds of promises, if, if, you're, if you're struggling with finances, then look up scriptures on provision and on God prospering you. If you're struggling with sickness, look up scriptures on healing and God's promise of healing you. 
If you're struggling with shame, look up scriptures on forgiveness and God's promise of forgiving you. Whatever it is, you must take in the promise on that topic. How can your faith grow to receive that particular promise? If you are barren or miscarrying, you must read God's promise that because Jesus bore the curse of the law, none shall miscarry in Israel. Exodus says that if you serve the Lord, He will bless your bread and your water. He will keep sickness from your midst. None shall miscarry and He shall fulfill the number of your days. That promise is for you, folks, because Jesus bore the curse. The curse was for you. It's no longer. The blessing is for you now because of Jesus. This is why we rejoice in what Jesus has done, because he's borne the curse for us, as Galatians 3 says. Redeemed us from the curse of the law so that the blessing, well, the blessing is a lot of things. Forgiveness of sin, not miscarrying, healed, long life, no sickness, not living in poverty, but prospering in everything that you do, I will make you the first and not the last, the head and not the tail. This is what God has said. Yes. You will lend and not borrow is in the promise. How are you going to walk in it? Believe. And if you don't believe, you're going to have the same life as everybody else. You're going to just perish in the wilderness. If you want to rise above and conquer and be in victory, like the scriptures have promised you, you got to take the Joshua and Caleb attitude and believe what God has said. I have given it to you. Everybody say, I have, I have given, it given it to you. Now replace it with whatever promise it is you're believing God for because that's how he talks about his promises. I've done it. Whether you receive it or not, it's done for you. Hallelujah. It's like if I built something, uh, some kind of you know, contraption you needed, and I said, hey, it's yours. Take it. And you're like, oh, no, it's not mine. I don't think it'll work. That's on you. That's not on me. I built it for you. It's right here. Take it. Everybody say, I take it, I take it. By, faith. by faith. That's not insulting to God. Jesus was not insulted by the woman with the issue of blood taking healing. The power went out from him automatically because she believed. And I'm telling you, it's already God's will to give it to you. So he was thrilled to give it to her. Amen. Thrilled. Who touched me? He wasn't mad. He was actually excited. Yes. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Amen. How did she talk? You ever paid attention to that story? She said out of her mouth, when I lay hold his garment, I shall be healed. My mom talked that way about my brother when they were saying, oh, leukemia, leukemia, leukemia. If what you're doing doesn't work, my God will. Yes. That's not normally how parents talk in the emergency room. It's fear. This is why ministers should show up in compassion and in faith because it's tough on parents. It's tough. But you as a parent can be in faith on behalf of your child and you can say, my child shall be made whole. That's how the woman with the issue of blood talked. Why don't you talk that way? She got the promise. If, if God wanted you to talk with your defeat and your false piety that you call humility, if he wanted you to talk that way, then that's how she would have talked. No. She said, I shall be made whole. And Jesus liked how she talked and behaved. So much so that the power went out automatically. God likes how Caleb talks here. We should by all means go up and take possession of it for we will certainly prevail over it. If you already have the promise, there is no more if it be thy will. That's not humility. That's doubt. True confidence in what God's already promised is actually true religious humility. You're boasting in God. Yes. You are humbly trusting him and not your own eyes. God likes how they talk, not how you and I are talking when we're talking defeat. He likes, we will certainly prevail over it. He likes that. Is that how you're talking to your giants? I will certainly prevail over it because, and then you cite the scripture, it is written, and you could go to Psalm 103, I am forgiven of all my sins. I am healed of all my diseases. Is that how you talk? Or do you go, if it be thy will, I'm forgiven of all my sins. 
and healed of all my diseases. If his word isn't his will, what is? What are you waiting for more than his word? Well, if I feel it, if I see it, then I know it's his will. Story of the Israelites in the wilderness tells you that that is bad theology. Well, if I feel it and if I see it, then I know it's his will. Nope, 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 nope. His word is his will. Stop waiting for something else. His word is his will. Yes. Get to it. Yes. We will certainly prevail over it. When I grab the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. I have made you the father of many nations. I have given the land to you. By his wounds we are healed. I know this isn't how people normally talk, and that helps you to identify God because it's how God talks. God talks different from everybody else. While things are unseen, he says they're done. Now you've encountered God. That kind of language is God. When something's unseen and yet it's done because you've received the word, that is God. Anything less than that is the serpent. Any sort of Well, there's giants. Well, they're strong. Well, the walls are high. That's all Satan. If you're receiving something, say amen. Amen. Don't go back to Egypt, folks. Uh, Numbers 14, verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation of the sons of Israel and Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. Moses and Aaron represent the Messiah and the priesthood interceding on behalf of the people for their sins. Because this is a huge, huge sin. Unbelief is the sin, folks. Unbelief is the sin. It's the sin. It's the Genesis 3 sin. No longer believing God's word, but believing Satan instead. That is the sin. They intercede on behalf And Joshua and Caleb tear their clothes, which is a sign of great distress. Verse 7, And they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Now, what pleases God? Well, I'll give you a reminder. Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So they are calling their fellow Israelites to faith if we're pleasing to God. This has nothing to do with works. The works will come after the faith. They'll go in and take the land. That's the work. But the faith is believing that it's already theirs. If we please God, He'll give us the land. How do you please God? Faith. Do you see that? If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Wow. So he says this. Pay attention to their language. This is faith language again. Okay. Do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land. So don't go against his promises and his word. Believe what he says. And don't fear. Everybody say no fear. Fear will rob you of faith. If you notice fear coming up, one of the first things that you can do is stop being afraid. What do you mean? I can't just stop. Yes, you can. Start praising God. Amen. Start praying. Start praying in the Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Command the fear to go. I have not given you a spirit of fear. I've given you a spirit of power, love, and self-control. Or sound mind if it's King James. I'm not giving you a spirit of fear. That don't come from God but of power, love, and self-control. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. We'll be hunting them. That's a big deal. Is that how the rest of them are talking? Are they saying, I will hunt down cancer. I will hunt down paralyzation. I will hunt down death. And I will subdue it by faith in my God. Amen. Hallelujah. 
What's your giant? I'm picking big giants on purpose. I'm not saying that cancer and paralyzation and death aren't big giants. I'm well aware that they're big giants. That's why I'm picking them. Big giants aren't bigger than my God. Their protection is gone from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. You apply this to whatever giant is in your life. God will be pleased. (laughs) This is the language he likes. Their protection is gone from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. God is not the cause of sickness. Permitting sickness due to sin. We talked about this at length in two kingdoms. You enter into Satan's kingdom and he's the tormentor when you believe Satan's word. When you believe God's word, you exit Satan's kingdom, you enter his and in his kingdom, there is no torment. Hence the beginning of Genesis and the end of Revelation are both no suffering. That's God's perfect will for you. Their protection has gone from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Is that a tragedy? Their response, and you'll find this too. You preach faith and trust in God's word and this is all true and the world is a lie and Satan is a liar and the father of all lies and don't believe the world and there's, there's, there's bishops in the church that, that there's 10 of them, 10 out of 12 that are leading the church that aren't telling people the truth and not in faith and man, they're going to want to stone you. How dare you? So-and-so died. I miscarried. I have cancer. This and that. How dare you not respect my giant? It's sad. You become evil in the eyes of your fellow Israelites when you believe God to the point they want to stone you to death. And all you want for them is the promise to be received. And they think, you're terrible and I should stone you to death. You're clearly not compassionate or considerate of my problem. Is that not exactly how they just responded? Let's stone them to death. Can you believe, you'd think, you'd think, you know, all this preaching of faith that Caleb and Joshua have been doing in these two chapters would help them come out of it. No, no, it's actually brought them to anger to the point of let's stone them to death. Let's trust in God's promises. You need to die. Let's believe God that it's our land. You need to die. That's their response. So don't be surprised if that's the kind of response you get as you believe God. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for his name's sake. Blessed are you. The promise is true. You can walk in it while they don't. Joshua and Caleb enter. I'm not thrilled about that. I don't think Joshua and Caleb wanted their friends to die in the wilderness, but you can't force people to receive promises, sadly. What does the Gospel of Mark say when Jesus went into his hometown full of unbelief? It says he could not do any mighty work there. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Why could he not do any mighty work there? He will not violate unbelief. I will not, I cannot force a promise into your life and God will not force you to receive a promise. Did he force any of them into the promised land? No. He gave them what they said. What did they say? They said, we're going to die in the wilderness. What did they get? Death in the wilderness. They said it first. God just said, yeah, according to your faith, be it done unto you. They said it first in this chapter. We're going to die in the wilderness. Fight the good fight of faith. Don't give up. And don't stone the messengers anymore. Repent of your sins and believe God's word. Cancer is not God's will for you. Paralyzation is not God's will for you. Death isn't even God's will for you. That's why there's the resurrection. Psalm 91. Psalm 103. These are promised to you. God wants to give you a long, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Long life and not a long life suffering with a chronic ailment. That's the giant to be slayed. Let's join together in faith. Don't stone, don't stone the messengers to death. Believe God's word that this is true. 
And don't be discouraged that 10 out of 12 don't join you in celebrating and believing the promises of God. I don't claim to have perfect faith. I'm just testifying that my son's ailment has been very real in the sense that my eyes saw it plenty and yet my heart knew that God's word was true and now my eyes are seeing that manifest. But the belief started before the manifestation in my son's body. Do you understand? So I'm not discrediting. I've been in real fear while my son's covered in hives and needs emergency asthma medication. You know, I've got EpiPens so that I can save his life if necessary. Do you understand? Yes. But even those actions are fighting, aren't they? I didn't just stand back and go, well, this is too bad. No, you do everything you can in love. But the greatest thing you can do is believe God's promise because that's what's going to actually beat it. That's what's going to beat the giant. Believe God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. By his wounds, we are healed. We're forgiven. We're healed. We're provided for. I'm the Lord that healeth thee. I'm the Lord, your provider. I'm the Lord, your victory. Why don't you put your faith in the identities of God that he gives us throughout his word? I'm the Lord, your peace. You don't have peace. You have anxiety. I am the Lord, your peace. He will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is set on him. You know, I had a season of anxiety and panic attacks that I overcame by faith. How? Once again, God delivered me. How? God's word. I realized that I was just in the wrong word all the time. God's word. And God's word brings peace to the soul, the mind. Spirit of fear can't stay. It has to go. No more anxiety. Something God told me, because it started with caffeine. Something God told me one of the last times that it was happening. He said it was never the caffeine. Those were important words for me to hear from the Holy Spirit. It was never the caffeine. It was never the caffeine. It was never the caffeine. Because it started to happen without caffeine. It was never the caffeine. What did he tell me by saying that? It was always the devil. The devil is the Wizard of Oz. He hides behind a curtain of something else. Oh, it's egg that your son is now having anaphylactic reactions. No, it's Satan. That's right. Do you understand? Yes. The Bible says that God made everything good. That includes eggs. Eggs are not supposed to cause my son's throat to close and him suffocate and die. It's Satan, not the egg. Yes. Do you understand? And it's not God either. No. No. Wow. God is not doing that to your child. No. Wow. Satan was why I was having anxiety. Put me in the emergency room three times. People think like, oh, Rich, you know, this is why you got to testify. Oh, you just preach this stuff and you don't know how hard it is. You know nothing. You're assuming too much. The reason I teach it with authority is because I've failed and succeeded. And I'm trying to help you see that success is in believing God's word and not in anything else. And I'm trying to help you see that, yes, you will be among the few when you think and believe this way. But you won't have anxiety anymore. COVID will heal. Your tinnitus will go away. Hello. Hello. Your children with anaphylactic reactions won't have them anymore. We're believing God and trusting God. Kylan has been improving. He was born with Hirschsprungs. He's had surgery. And um, that he has control of of his uh, bowel movements. And you know what? He's been feeling it ahead of time and asking to go to the potty. And getting on the potty without going in his diaper. Good job, Kylan. We're proud of you. And we praise God. Well, when we have a regression, does that mean the promise isn't true? No, you fight the giant. Easier preached than done, but you fight the giant. It is written. How do you have victory? The scriptures say that Christ always leads us in triumph. How? Faith. Everybody say faith. Faith. 
But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of the meeting to all the sons of Israel. Look at what God says in verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people be disrespectful to me? And how long will they not believe me despite all the signs that I have performed in their midst? If you take a moment to think about, the scriptures say that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. Think about every single good thing in your life. Stop thinking about the illness, the debt, the other things. Don't give those your mind anymore. Think about the goodness of God in your life. Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Have that perspective and look at the good. And what you'll find is God's already done a lot of miracles for you that you probably didn't glorify him for. This is why they died in the, in the wilderness as well. It says, how long will they not believe in me or believe me despite all the signs that I've performed in their midst, despite everything I've already done for them, they still not believe me. I'm telling you, God has done a tremendous amount of miracles in all of our lives. So Satan goes, well, but what about this problem? No, think about the goodness of God and let it encourage you that goodness is coming in that area too. I have given you the land. See, God is displeased because they're not believing him. And by default, they're believing the serpent. Who are you believing? The word of God or not? Okay, so, um, for the sake of continuing on, let's go to Hebrews 3. Let's go to Hebrews 3. All right. How much battery we have? Oh, we still have some. Praise the Lord. Let's go to Hebrews 3. And let's look at the doctrine of this story. So Hebrews 3 and 4 use this particular wilderness story that we just read a portion of as a doctrinal foundation for what to do and what not to do. <laughs> So let's read it together. Are you eager to read it and learn? If you are, say amen. amen. All right, friends. And those of you online, thank you for still being here. Hope the Lord is encouraging you. I know that he is. If you're still here, you're being encouraged. Hebrews 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. Everybody say, consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. Now in Romans 4, in the King James, it says that Abraham considered not his own body now as good as dead. So Abraham considered not his body and its symptoms and what his eyes saw. Hear that. Considered not. The scriptures say the mindset on the flesh is death. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Jesus said, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The word I've spoken to you is full of the spirit and life. <laughs> so the words of Jesus are full of life and the spirit. So you want to consider Jesus, not your body. Abraham did not consider his body. You go and read it. Romans 4 in the King James says, being not weak in faith, he considered not his body. Okay, so Hebrews 3 is starting us in contrast to that with we are to consider Jesus, not our bodies. Consider Jesus, not the waves. Peter needed to consider Jesus and his word, not the waves and the wind. When he considered Jesus and his word, he walked on water. When he considered the waves and the wind, he fell and, and sunk. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses also was in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Amen. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. <clears throat> now, I want to point something out about Moses that we didn't read, but I'm going to read it real quick for you. 
that Christ intercedes for us. Isaiah 53 says he made intercession for us, that he interceded for us wrongdoers. What's our wrongdoing? Unbelief and therefore sin. Moses intercedes on behalf of the Israelites as well. Now he's not Christ, so his intercession is not the same level and magnitude as Christ. But as a type of Christ, notice what happens. <coughs> uh, Numbers 14, 13. But Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear of it. For by your strength you brought this people up from their midst, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are in the midst of this people, because you, Lord, are seen eye to eye. While your cloud stands over them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day, and in a pillar of fire by night, now, if you put this people to death all at once, then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, now think about this. He's asking God to not put them to death. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. You got to start realizing this, folks, that what I deserved was laid on Jesus, but I did deserve it. He interceded, just like Moses is interceding here. <clears throat> Verse 16, since the Lord could not bring this people into the land, which he promised them by oath, he slaughtered them in the wilderness. In other words, that's what people would say. Verse 17, so now please let the power of the Lord be great, just as you have declared, saying, the Lord is slow to anger and abundant in mercy, forgiving wrongdoing and violation of his law. But he will by no means leave the guilty <clears throat> unpunished, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generations. Now, what does that mean? He will forgive all sin unless you don't repent. Guilt remains for generations. If nobody's repenting, everybody inherits the sins and receives the consequences of sin. Do you understand? Yeah. When you've believed in Jesus Christ and you teach your children Jesus and they grow up as Christians, the same is true, that they receive the blessing and the inheritance follows for generations. Okay, But the curse will follow for generations on people who are guilty, who do not repent. You remain, your guilt remains if you don't repent. You understand that, right? So that's all Moses is getting at here, is that the guilt will remain. But God is merciful and abundant in mercy. Isn't that what he just said? What did he say? The Lord is slow to anger and abundant in mercy, forgiving wrongdoing and violation of his law. If you come to him for forgiveness, you will receive it. Okay, verse 19. Please forgive the guilt of this people in accordance with the greatness of your mercy, just as you also have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Imagine, this is what Jesus has done for us as the perfect high priest, as the perfect sacrifice. Please forgive the guilt of this people. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? Father, I present to you my blood shed on their behalf. Please forgive this people of their unbelief and their sin. And our high priest received for us forgiveness from our Father in heaven. And our Father in heaven was pleased to give it to us, hence why he sent Jesus, to pay the lawful penalty. Jesus is our intercessor, the same way that Moses intercedes here. Look at this, verse 20. So the Lord said, I have forgiven them in accordance with your word. That's what he does. Now, they still die in the wilderness. Why? Because they confessed and believed that. And so it's rendered to them. But they're not, they're literally able to live 40 more years. They don't die. This is real similar to Christians who have received forgiveness of sin, but they're still struggling with chronic ailments and they're not walking in the promise. God loves you. You're alive. You're not like dying for your sins but you're not receiving the promise either. That's not a good place to be. God wants you to go all the way to the promised land, not out of Egypt, but dead in the wilderness. All the way to the promised land. Receive the inheritance, the forgiveness of sins and the inheritance. A lot of people are just, yeah, I got forgiveness of sins and now I'm just going to suffer. No, forgiveness of sins and the inheritance is God's will for you. Don't refuse it. What we read earlier in Isaiah. In repentance and rest, you will be saved. But you were not willing. Don't be unwilling. Say, I am not unwilling. I receive the promise by faith. 
Amen. It's good to make faith declarations. Learn to do that in your private life, not just during the sermons. Okay. Um, verse 6, Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. Okay, good. If we hold fast, look at, if we hold fast our confidence yeah. and the boast of our hope firm until the end. This is what I've been talking about this whole time. Confidence is faith. Okay, so we must hold fast. If we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope, you boast in expectation. That word hope is expectation. Elpis or elpizo is always expectation. So we boast in our expectation. What did uh, Caleb say? He said, I'm certain that we will possess the land. That's boasting in expectation, not in his own abilities but in the Lord who promised Amen. and in the Lord's power Amen. that he had power to fulfill. He was fully assured that what God had promised, he had power to fulfill. So if we hold fast our confidence, our faith and the boast of our expectation from until the end, that's how we're going to receive. You got to hold it fast all the way, all the way. Everybody say all the way. All the way. All the way. Verse seven. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear your, if, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Yep. Who hardened hearts here? Hardened hearts. They hardened their own hearts as in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. In other words, they didn't even repent, not genuinely from the heart, that whole 40 year period. Forty years they still tested God, grumbled, didn't believe Him. Their heart didn't change. Their heart never changed. Do you understand? Yeah. Sometimes their lips might have said the right things. Their heart didn't change. Hmm? They profess me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Verse 10, Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. And they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Who confessed that they wouldn't enter the rest? The people of Israel did. And then God affirmed it. According to your faith, be it done unto you. Look at this. Look at how Hebrews 3 titles this. The peril of unbelief. I almost titled the sermon that. But I think from wilderness to promise is better because we're going to promise the promised land. And we're going to learn from others' unbelief so that we don't do that. <laughs> Verse 12, Hebrews 3, 12. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. What's the fall a result of? The fall of man is from an unbelieving heart. Unbelieving heart falls. Peter believes Jesus, walks on water. Peter stops believing Jesus and uses his eyes and is scared and all of that sinks. Unbelieving heart falls. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching so good. <laughs> Unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Verse 13. But encourage one another day after day. Everybody say encourage one another. I stand before you to encourage you, not as someone who has perfect theology or perfect faith, but as someone who believes that this is true and that we can all join together and encourage each other believing this instead of stoning each other to death over it. Yes. <laughs> and notice what it also says, but encourage one another day after day. In the Greek, this is day after day or every day, we might say in English. Every day. How are you going to stay in faith? Encouraged in the word every day? Amen. That's the only way. That's the only way. You turn on the news, it's 24-7, isn't it? 24-7. So Satan's voice is 24-7, and God's voice is 24-7, and you choose which one you're going to listen to. Every day. Y'all are trying to have faith by having a Bible verse pop up on your app in the morning that you briefly read and go about your day. Or you listen to, you know, you can't stomach a two-hour sermon, so you listen to a 20-minute sermon, maybe even a 40-minute sermon, but once a week. And you're like, why aren't the dead being raised? Yeah, right. <laughs> this is all true. 
how are we going to get to the dead raising folks with a Bible verse a day? It's this thick. Faith comes by hearing and hearing continually the word of God. It's this thick. And you're going to read a sentence. And then you're going to cure cancer. God's promises are true. I, 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 there's no insult to God. This will do it. This book raises the dead. God's word raises the dead. This will do it. The problem is us. We're like, well, I know that the power to raise the dead is here, but uh, I'm going to read it for uh, five seconds and then, okay. <laughs> oh, why aren't the dead raised? It, sometimes I just think that we are arguing with God and he's flabbergasted. He's amazed. And, and where do I get that from? Even doctrinally, his hometown. It says he was amazed at their unbelief, almost, almost like speechless. It doesn't make sense, folks. You're not going to have the results of Peter if you don't have the faith of Peter. And the faith of Peter grew gradually over time, consistently hearing Jesus' word every day for three and a half years and then for the rest of his life. Do you understand? If you want the same results, you've got to imitate those who came before you. You have to imitate those who through faith and patience inherited the promises. But encourage one another day after day. Everybody say day after day. day, after day. day, after day. Not just one day, seven days. Day after day. Daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. As long as it is still called today. Is today today? Yes, yep. today, today. All right. So when you wake up tomorrow is tomorrow today. Yes. <laughs> so that means tomorrow and today and every day encourage one another with what? The word. Why? So you don't have an unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. So you don't have the kind of heart that perishes in the wilderness. Amen. Okay? As long as it's called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Yep. Sin will come along and deceive you. Yes, It'll come. The snake will come. Verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if. Everybody say if. Yes. Not enough if preaching in the church. If. We hold fast the beginning of our assurance, firm until the end, firm until the end. You must be assured that this is true, firm until the end. I have made you the father of many nations. That's true for 25 years, firm until the end, firm until Isaac is born, firm until the healing manifests, firm until all of your bills are paid, firm until your body resurrects. Firm until the end. Fight the good fight of faith. Firm until the end. <laughs>